One of the new feature that we have for the monthly webinars is highlighting an activity related to this month's topic. This month we're looking back at our planet from arguably one of the most important orbital observation platforms, Landsat. Landsat has enabled us to learn a great deal about both the natural and the engineered world and helps us to monitor changes in various Earth and human systems. The Landsat Education website has a lot of really great stuff, and a lot of it is actually on the USGS site, and I, I hope that Terry talks a little bit about how Landsat really is a partnership between the US Geological Survey and NASA. Uh, I'm not sure that a lot of people know that, and I, I think that that's really exciting, having been a geologist once upon a time. Um, so one of the ones in particular that I thought was really, really cool that you could potentially use in your outreach is, and this is actually on the NSN outreach uh, resource page for this webinar, is a nice little booklet called Tracking Change Over Time. This is a really great booklet. It's got some activities. A lot of it is designed more for classrooms, but it's applicable in your public outreach as well. And so they can, they go through and show how you can use some of the Landsat imagery to see exactly what it is that you're looking at. Can you identify some of the features that are showing up in the imagery? You could make comparisons. And so here's a very nice comparison between Salt Lake City uh, taken by Landsat 5 in August 1995 and by Landsat 8 taken in September of 2015. And so there's some significant differences that you can see in these. One of the other things that I, I thought was really, really great is there's a, a really great little activity about resolution, about detector resolution. And so you can you know, definitely go and check this out. What is the difference if you have a five by five or a 10 by 10 or a 30 by 30 pixel detector? What does that do to the resolution? Is there such a thing as too much resolution? It turns out that actually too much resolution can be perhaps just as bad as not enough. One of the other ones, and hopefully this, this is going to come across, let's see, actually I'm gonna stop sharing and then reshare because I'm not sure if that's, that didn't work the last time. But another really, really great tool that you could use, and this was presented to us uh, once upon a time last, uh, last spring by Kevin Hussey, when he came and shared with us NASA's eyes. And so there's actually an eyes on the Earth. And this has a lot of different visualizations you can do. You can see all the different Earth monitoring uh, missions that are orbiting the Earth. And then there's a lot of other things. You can check out the vital signs. If you want to see where all the carbon monoxide is, here we have the aqua satellite that's going around. And here we have uh, an indication of the carbon monoxide. And so this is another way that you can bring some of the earth monitoring imagery into your outreach efforts locally. So with that, we've got a lot of really great tools. I will put the links to these in the chat window in just a few minutes. And so make sure you check those out. So during the webinar, most of you know that we have a chat window and a Q&A window. And so please feel free to greet, your, greet each other in the chat window and put any questions you have for Terry into the Q&A window. That helps us to keep track of what's in there. Also in the chat window, if you, want to be able, if you want everyone to be able to see what you're saying, please make sure to select all attendees and panelists, and then it'll go to everyone. And so now for our featured program. Terry Arvidson started her Landsat involvement at General Electric over 37 years ago and followed its evolution with Martin Marietta, Lockheed Martin, and Lidos Innovations. As the senior systems engineer, she's participated in all mission phases and all mission elements from the spacecraft to the sensors to the data processing and to the distribution of the data. All of this has given her a really nice big picture perspective of the Landsat program and she enjoys working with stakeholders such as us and all of you to bring this to the public. And she very much enjoys sharing her passion for all things Landsat. And so please welcome Terry Arvidson. And I assume you want me to share my screen now? 
Yeah, it's all and you. All me. <laughs> Except I forgot to do the other thing. Hang on. Oh, it's already done. Okay. And all right. Um, thank you for that introduction. And um, I'll make sure to cover a couple things uh, in light of what you showed in your um, prequel there. Um, basically, uh, this is all about how Landsat is looking at Earth from space. Um, we are one of many satellites that are out there. Um, they're looking at all kinds of stuff. They're looking at carbon, water, land, aerosols, atmospheric chemistry, sea surface, winds, gravity, you name it, we've got satellites up there doing that. And that's good because one of the things that we've learned is that this is Earth's system. It is not just land, it's not just water, it's not just atmosphere. It's not even just outer space, but everything interacts and works together, and we have to keep that in mind. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that even just in the 45 years that the Landsat program has, been, has had assets up in space, our population has grown almost 4 billion, B with a B, 4 billion people more than when we started. And the world itself is changing. And so we really need to have good tools, good technology. We need to manage these resources. And that's where Landsat comes into play. Um, everybody's got access to imagery from space now. You can get on your phone, you can do a Google Maps, um, you use MapQuest to figure out where you are, you can bring up a satellite view. Everybody's got it. But it didn't used to be that way. Um, this awe-inspiring image of the blue marble, back in the 1960s when this was taken by the um, Apollo 8 astronauts, it just opened everyone's eyes as to, oh my goodness, look at the Earth and, and look at the swirling clouds and the water and the land and what's going on and, and shouldn't we you know, pay attention to that? Well, it was the U.S. Geological Survey. It was the Department of the Interior tasked with managing all the land, um, managing the interior of our country, that came up with the idea that, you know, we're using airplanes and we're taking pictures, but it's expensive. We can only do so much at a time. Why don't we try doing this from space? And they tried to get NASA interested in this, and NASA said, eh, you know, we're, we're busy with astronauts. We don't want to do that. So back in 1968, um, Stuart Udall, who was then Secretary of the Interior, with, um, that's who's st standing here on the left, and then William T. Pacora, who was the director of the U.S. Geological Survey, they got together and put together an Earth Resources Observation Satellite Program and announced to the world that USGS and Department of Interior were going to launch a satellite to monitor the Earth. Well, that wasn't very popular with NASA, nor with the Department of Defense. They did not want these geologists and land managers to have a satellite up in space. And eventually, NASA was convinced um, that they needed to be the ones that did it. And so the Landsat program got kicked off. In the early days, it was called the Earth Resources Technology Satellite, ERTS, E-R-T-S. And this is a picture. Um, we found all sorts of old photographs when we were working on building a history of Landsat. And this is one of the early satellites. It's an engineering model a structural model that they put in this centrifuge um, here at Goddard, and um, they were testing it out. It was um, a, uh, a satellite bus that um, came from another program called Nimbus. Um, and they put this out there in the centrifuge, and they started the test, and all of a sudden, the cameras they were using to monitor it went blank. It was like, where'd it go? And they had forgotten to strengthen one area on that torso of the spacecraft, and it had collapsed into a corner. So fortunately, there was another one out there that they could use, and they managed to do that testing um, just fine. And 
completed the build in two years. I mean, that, given the early days, they managed to do it in two years, and it was launched in 1972, and um, this is an artist's rendition. But we've got this mechanical butterfly. We had this mechanical butterfly out there in space taking images of the Earth from, um, from 7,000 or 700, um, 800 kilometers up in space. And um, it had on it two sensors. One mimicked what we were getting from the airplanes that were taking aerial photography. And this was the return beam Viticon. And basically it was like um, television cameras. And they would take um, 4,000 pixel resolution images. So you talk about your high def televisions that we have now. Back in the 1970s, we were taking 4,000 pixel resolution images. Um, unfortunately, there was an electrical issue with the um, instrument and it ended up setting the um, whole spacecraft into a tumble, which we managed to get it out of. And that instruments stay turned off the entire um, uh, rest of that mission. Fortunately, there was a second um, instrument on there. And this one was totally experimental. It, um, it had moving parts. It had um, rotating shutters. It had scan mirrors. It they were vibrating. <coughs> Sorry, I have a cold, so I apologize in advance for my coughing. It had um, vibrating, you know, all kinds of things that were moving. And everyone thought, <laughs> there's no way this was going to work. However, they saw the first images that came down. And this is one of the early images. Um, and uh, they looked at that and they thought, oh, look at all of these spiral patterns here. It looks like a moiré pattern or something. Oh, there's something wrong here. Until one of the geologists spoke up and said, you know what? These are the Wachita Mountains, and that is exactly what they look like. And so that is exactly right. And one of the naysayers, Alden Calvacaresis, he was a USGS cartographer. He actually invented um, the Mercator projection. He, um, he came back and, and he just, he gave in and he said, that is a map. And he was totally sold on the concept. And then from that point on, the program has just you know, gone a mile a minute. Um, this is an image of Pine Island Glacier. Um, it's actually from Landsat 8 um, in the background there. But what we found using Landsat data was um, that we had maps that were totally off base. Um, we also helped um, with the new science back then of plate tectonics with mapping fault lines and discovering lineaments and um, we map sea ice, um, we inventory various features. It was amazing and we had people from all over the world wanting to participate in the program because it was their way to get involved in, in the space program without having to launch something. They could use space data to improve their countries. And that was a very important part of our, um, of our program. Um, what you see here, and it, you'll see it a couple times during, um, during, the, during this presentation, we launched three of those butterfly-shaped um, uh, spacecraft, Landsats 1, 2, and 3, um, the first in 72, and then 75, and then 78. In 1982, we launched the next generation. And you'll notice that the spacecraft looks very much different. We have this really tall boom holding this large antenna for communications. And this was to communicate with the new tracking and data relay system that was being launched by NASA in the, in the early 1980s. The spacecraft itself was very modular. You can't see it in here, but there are actually handles on a lot of these um, systems that allow them to be slid out and then replacement slid back in because this was actually meant to be um, uh, shuttle um, serviceable. 
the new things that were on there was a new instrument called a thematic mapper. And this picture in the lower left is showing how large that was. That's not even the entire um, instrument within the picture. And you can see from the people in it how large it was. Um, here they're working on that, that large antenna system. And the whole thing, including the boom that it was on, would fold down and those long arrays would fold in and that would all fit in the nose cone of a, um, of a rocket or within the bay of a shuttle. And the intention was to launch a shuttle from Vandenberg Air Force Base on the West Coast and to um, release the spacecraft into, into um, orbit. Unfortunately, that program, uh, the West Coast launch capability for the shuttle, um, got canceled, schedule and cost, and uh, some concerns about the pads out there. And so we did end up launching um, on a rocket. The big contribution was that we now extended the um, spectral resolution of our imagery. Before this, um, we were looking in the visible spectrum, the Roy G. Biv, what we can see with our eyes, plus we were looking at near infrared, um, which we can't see, but these um, were the range of Landsats 1, 2, and 3. With Landsat 4, we introduced near and mid infrared, as well as a um, later a thermal capability. And so, in this image to the right, um, this is Carlton, um, Washington. And you can see what may look like clouds, but they're actually wisps of smoke coming from forest fires. And then there are areas where the fires had been and that were no longer active. So somewhere in here, there's a fire scar. But it's really hard to tell in this image, which is just looking at the visible bands, red, green, and blue, which is what we would see if we were looking at this from outside of, a, of an airplane window. When we add the near infrared, which is what we could see with aerial photography, the sensors that we could fly back then, as well as um, what we had on the early Landsats, the vegetation um, in, the, in the near IR, red, and green combination of bands all the vegetation comes out red and bare land comes out, um, comes out brownish. But it's still kind of hard to distinguish fire scars from other types of bare soil. If you add in the um, shortwave IR, all of a sudden, look at what you can see. This is a combination of shortwave IR, near infrared, and green. And all of a sudden, we've got this ring down here in the bottom center. And this is a fire scar. This is land that was burned in a recent um, fire. And you compare that with older scars that are pinkish, they're starting to get a little bit of vegetation on them. And all of a sudden we have so much more information that we can glean out of these, out of this level of imagery. Um, you remember this that we were going to launch Landsat um, 4 and 5 from the shuttle. Well, with Landsat 5, Landsat 4 had some problems and, and we ended up turning it off because it had um, some power concerns. But Landsat 5 kept going and going for so long that it actually won the Guinness Book of World Records for the longest observational satellite of the Earth's land surface. And that has given us the ability to do what um, Brian was showing earlier with um, uh, change over time, being able to look at how things changed um, from early to, uh, you know, early in the, in the program and to 10, 20, 30, 40 years later. We almost lost Landsat 5 in 2009, right before the, the ops crew left, um, for at the end of the day, they had one more contact left. When they did that, they noticed that the, the Landsat 5 was tumbling out of control. And it turned out one of our gyroscopes had gone for fluid. And um, they were able to get it back into control, um, turned off that uh, gyroscopes, and, um, 
And from that point on, we had almost, um, we changed our operations and we had almost 24 hour monitoring of that satellite. You gotta give it credit. I mean, in 2009, it had launched in 1984. So it was already a grand old dame. And things were going wrong as they do for all of us at that age. So um, uh, we monitored it very carefully from that point on. So now we're into the next generation of satellites. Um, Landsat 6 was our anomaly. Landsat 6 never did make it successfully into orbit. Um, it had, when they went to, um, to do an orbit maneuver to get it um, boosted up into its final position, evidently there was a leak, um, and uh, we, we believe that it blew up. Um, and re-entered. We call it our, our oceanographic mission as opposed to our land mission because it's somewhere in the Indian Ocean. But um, that one was built when we were in a commercialization period. So we actually had a private company under, um, under contract to NOAA building that satellite. Um, in 1992, um, the uh, control commercialization of Landsat was ended. Um, the commercial group could still operate Landsats um, four and five and make money off of them, but, um, and, but Landsat, and they could build and launch Landsat six and make money off of that. But Landsat seven was returned to government control. Unfortunately, Landsat six, um, failed its launch in 1993, and the company kind of lost interest in Landsats after that, because at that same time, there were other satellites being launched like Spot and, and some commercial satellites, and they were getting into better resolution than what we were getting with our Landsats. And you could make more money off of that. And so they were, um, the commercial company was actually happy to have Landsat taken over by um, the government and to have Landsat 7 um, under government control. So we did um, build Landsat 7. This time it was, it was built on the East Coast and to be launched on the West Coast, we had to ship it over. Um, and this is a picture of the shipping container on this big, huge semi-trailer being backed up into the C5 that has been melt down. Um, in the process, we had all kinds of gotchas. Um, the ramp had problems. They ended up having to, to um, add shims in. Um, they're hard to see, but in here, eventually um, they had to shim it so that they could get the right angle. There's very little um, clearance there. Um, and then in the flight to the West Coast, it um, there was a gas leak from one of the generators on the truck. They found a bearing back on the original runway and thought, oh, goodness, the C5 is not going to be able to kneel again when it gets to the other end. And they wanted to um, divert to a different place where they could um, uh, have some maintenance done. And, and our guys said, no, your job is to get us to Vandenberg. And so they went ahead and landed at Vandenberg and everybody was fine. And we successfully launched in 1999. Um, Brian mentioned resolution. Um, starting with Landsat 4, we had 30 meter resolution capability with our thematic mappers, and then later with the enhanced thematic mapper plus that flew on Landsat 7. And what that does, if you want to get an idea of what that means, 30 meters is about the infield of a baseball stadium. This is Target Field in Minneapolis, Minnesota. What we got with Landsat 7 was a panchromatic band. This is one of the things that the um, commercial satellite, wanted, commercial operator wanted to add to Landsat 6. And what we flew on Landsat 7 was basically Landsat 6's instrument with some more um, tweaking and improvements done to it. But this 15 meter would get you between home base and the pitcher's mound. So you get this additional level of, of, um, of resolution, spatial resolution, and we actually use that to clarify um, the other 
images done with the other bands to, to sharpen them up. It's called our sharpening band. Um, but if you were to look at just um, these pixels, you wouldn't necessarily, you know, if you had a tiny pixel, if you had one that's the commercial size that shows you the, the pool in your neighbor's yard or shows you just one of these bases, it doesn't show you the context. You don't know if you're looking at a schoolyard field or if you're looking at a major league stadium like this one or where you are. So the value of resolution, spatial resolution, is depending on what you need, you first can see like the East Coast using a weather satellite, then you can narrow it down to um, a state or a county or a neighborhood using moderate resolution like our Landsats, and then you can get down to your neighbor's backyard or um, you know, the details of, of the little boats that are going down the river or whatever. And that gives you, you know, the, the really gory details. You, everything has its place. The Landsat Archive, um, as of January, our goal has always been global coverage. One of the things we discovered was due to various reasons through, throughout the program life, we haven't really had global coverage until Landsat 7. Um, and you, the color depth here, um, when you get into the blues, you're getting into almost constant coverage. For Landsat, constant means every 16 days. And, um, oops, I'm gonna back up on you. Every 16 days. And so um, the, the ability to monitor all the changes that are happening every 16 days over the past 40 years it's just a tremendous amount of information to support global change science. Landsat 7 just flew its 100,000th orbit on February 1st, um, uh, just this last Friday. And that's about 15 round trips to the sun. The, uh, that's the ops crew in their control center. And they had a cake that showed the odometer changing over from from five nines to 100,000, and that's just amazing. Um, we are currently building Landsat 8. Um, it's actually being built in uh, Arizona, and so it's going to get transported out to Vandenberg um, and will be launched off of an Atlas V, or was launched off of an, sorry, we are building Landsat 9. We did build Landsat 8. Um, it was also built in Arizona. Those two are like um, very close twins to each other. Um, not quite identical, but almost identical twins. Um, and it's being launched on Delta V. Five. Um, five years ago, last Sunday, um, February 11th, um, we launched Landsat 8. So it has met its mission um, specification, its mission life of five years. But like a good Landsat, it's just going to keep going and going and going. At least that's our prayer. So over those years, things have changed a lot. Um, <laughs> this is some of the early um, image analysis consoles and some of the data. We did not have pretty digital data. We were back at analog, things that, um, like photo prints, um, working with film negatives using line printers and over strikes to get different shades of gray to show us what the different changes were. Like these are probably farm fields and a, a river or a stream that's going through. And such a change that is. Uh, the other thing that has changed over time is the um, uh, cost of data. Over the years, it got up as high as $4,400 for a single scene. Since, since 2008, data has been available for free. The peak year of sales before that was um, uh, 57,000 scenes. And the year, or I think it's actually the month after we went to free data, it was in the millions um, of data that was downloaded by folks. So, as I've mentioned, everything has gone out of Vandenberg Air Base. Um, all of our Landsats are in a polar orbit. 
Um, and I have a video on that in a second, so I won't go into any further detail on that. Um, all of those that have gotten into orbit have outlived their design lives. And one of our key um, precepts for this program has been continuity. All our data is intercomparable. We have got tremendous calibration and validation folks that make it so that this stack of data, which is the same scene through the years, you can actually take them and do comparisons and track change over time. And that is just invaluable. And we've been doing that for 45, 47 years. So I'm gonna play a video now and this will describe our orbit and orbital swap and why we go with a polar orbit as opposed to an equatorial one, which is what the space shuttle does. Let me find my cursor here. As a Landsat satellite flies over the surface of the Earth, the instruments aboard the satellite are able to view a swath 185 kilometers wide and collect images along that swath as the satellite proceeds uh, through its orbit. The spacecraft travels at approximately 4.7 miles per second. The satellite travels from north to south while it's over the sunlit portion of the Earth and travels south to north over the dark side of the Earth. One orbit takes about 99 minutes. So that's about uh, approximately 15 orbits in a 24 hour period. The orbits maintained such that after uh, 16 days, the entire surface of the Earth has come within view of the Landsat instruments while sunlit. And then on day 17, the first ground path is repeated. So we get to view the entire surface once every 16 days. The narrator there was Dr. Jim Irons. He is the um, Landsat 8 um, project scientist and one of, and um, has been involved in the Landsat program for forever. Um, th just as an example of some of the stuff, so I'm going to go through some of the applications of all this wonderful data. Um, on August 25th, the Virgin Islands in the top image are looking as you would expect, um, a little bit cloud covered um, and lots of green, lots of lush vegetation. On September 10th, after Hurricane Irma went through, you'll notice that they're very brown. What we're seeing here is um, defoliated trees from the wind, um, mud and sand coming in um, with, the, with the flooding waters that um, overwhelmed the vegetation. Um, another application is in the agricultural areas. Um, on the left, it's very easy to see the healthy um, vegetation that's growing. Our, the near-infrared band really responds to chlorophyll, or I should say the other way around. The chlorophyll in plants really absorbs the, um, the near-infrared and or reflects the near-infrared. And so what we see um, in our imagery um, are these shades of green that um, show us where the healthy crops are if we go in and we start using some of the other parts like the shortwave IR and the thermal um, IR, we can get into more detailed evaluation and analysis in looking at things like evaporation of the soil, soil wetness, and also looking at water loss from plants through transpiration, and that's called evapotranspiration. And that's actually one of the newest applications that we're seeing um, now that we've had some really great thermal band data available off of Landsat 7 and Landsat 8. The other thing that now that data is free is we can do global analyses. Can you imagine getting a 100 um, nautical mile image, square image, of every bit of land on the Earth? and paying $4,400 for it, it's just totally unaffordable. But now that data is free, we can download the entire archive, we can analyze tree cover for the entire globe, 
And what we see here in, in shades of red are the overwhelmingly forested areas of the world. And we can do analyses that, for example, would show forest loss between um, 2000 and 2012. It's hard to see, um, probably for you guys, but up in the um, northern boreals, yeah, that's redundant, up in the boreal region, there are some pinks showing um, 70 or 80 percent or more loss of um, vegetation. We see it a little bit here in um, Indonesian area, a little bit in the um, Brazilian area, and then again up in the boreal regions over um, Canada. Analyses like these were just totally not possible beforehand. Music. So this is running through that a second time. If you just look at, you know, pick an area and watch it as it changes over time, it's amazing how, how the landscape is recovering from that terrible, overwhelming onslaught of mud and ash that they got. And uh, it's, it's enabled us to understand how well they have, um, or, or how forests under those conditions can recover. It's another aspect of um, the ability to use Landsat data to monitor the earth. Here's um, another great thing. One of the first inventories of coral reefs was done using Landsat data. In fact, I remember getting an email from um, one of the uh, government officials on New Caledonia saying, hey, um, you've got a, uh, a scene that's identified as being this particular um, atoll, and uh, we've been trying to locate it for years. Can you send us the coordinates that you found in your imagery because we can't find it? Um, so that's you know, totally an amazing kind of email to get. Um, this is actually a brand new I um, island back in December 2014 in the Tonga um, uh, archipelago, um, this new island was born from a submerged volcano that erupted. It was only expected to last a few weeks, but um, it's actually, um, has, has, it's this tough material, T-U-F-F, -F, and geologists now believe that this is gonna last anywhere from six to 30 years. And it's really being studied by folks like Dr. Jim Garvin down um, at NASA headquarters, who is very much into Mars and how we're going to explore Mars in the future, because a lot of the same kind of volcanoes um, come up with the same kind of materials there. And so he's really looking at um, island volcanoes and other desert volcanic regions of the world using Landsat data to understand what kinds of things they'll be able to see and what best um, sensors could be used for Mars when they, um, as we launch more and more um, missions towards Mars. Um, and basically this has been a really fast um, review of the last 45 years of the Landsat program. Um, you can always read the book. Um, I'm part of the Landsat Legacy Project team. We just published a book under the auspices of the American Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. Um, it's available at aesprs.org slash Landsat. I think Brian's gonna post this um, later. Um, the folks that in, were involved in this book, we all have a passion for Landsat. Um, we've been involved, some of us, since um, before the Landsat 1 launch. 
And um, it's just been an amazing journey back into the history of Landsat and um, what actually got it started um, and all the different um, hurdles, as well as um, the amazing discoveries, the development of technology and um, the help that we've been able to give to science um, in establishing a, a global science um, for the world. So I guess at that, I'll um, stop and uh, take questions. All right. Well, thank you so much. And so we do have a few questions that have come up. And so if anyone else has any other questions, um, and if you inadvertently put them into the chat window, uh, we'd appreciate it if you would uh, uh, put it into the Q&A window so that we can find it more easily. So William asked, he uh, had, it sounds like he had an early exposure to Landsat data. He says that in 1977, he was able to get a magnetic tape of Landsat data from NASA to use for his undergraduate degree project. And contained only one image and four spectral bands. So can Landsat still be acquired by private citizens for free? What format would be used? And so I think that you partially answered that question, but what uh, maybe in, um, to expand that question, uh, what's the format and how, what's the, the, how do they go about getting to the data? Um, if you go out to um, landsat.usgs.gov, um, you can get data there. Um, they have several tools available that help you visualize um, where you're going. Actually, um, if I, I don't know how to operate this very well. Maybe I shouldn't do that. Okay. Um, I was going to go out and, and just go out to the, um, to the site, but they have tools there that you can use. You can locate the area that you're interested in. What you're going to get is digital data. So you're actually going to get um, data downloaded um, to your computer. And um, you don't need to get a, a magnetic tape or a CD or anything like that. You actually get the data itself. And then there are programs out there that will manipulate that data for you, um, including some that are, um, that are available through Google Earth. Um, and other free tools that are out there. So there's a lot of ways to do that. Or you can just browse through um, their site and find pictures. You can also get JPEGs um, if you want to, you know, build a poster or just um, have something on your, on your desktop for your computer. Um, all the data is free. They are in the process of putting together more, um, uh, evolved products. Right now you get a product that is geometrically and radiometrically corrected. It has been corrected to um, make up for any terrain differences within the context of the image. So any geometric um, distortion because you've got a, a 3,000 foot mountain in the middle of your scene is going to be accounted for. Um, it, they are now working at giving you surface reflection products so that right now we measure the reflected light up at the satellite so top of atmosphere correction we are now taking out the influence of the atmosphere so that now the data values that you get are down at the surface um, so that's a huge step forward atmosphere correction or taking out the the impacts of the atmosphere has been a big bugaboo um, has been the problem to solve for the last 15 years and they've done it and so we're really really proud of that and um, they're going to start putting out these level two what they call level two products um, with surface reflection um, very shortly if not already great so Darian has uh, got a number of questions, but uh, let's go with the first one that he asked. And so what is the current resolution that Landsat has? And I know that there's probably been a, a variety of resolutions and you know, exactly what would you be able to see you know, given the resolution? What's the smallest thing that somebody could see? 
Um, the resolution um, for the current Landsats that are up there now, Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, is 30 meters um, for all of our reflected light bands. So um, red, green, blue, the near infrared, and the shortwave infrareds. Um, and then we have um, panchromatic bands that are at 15 meters. Panchromatic goes across, it's like for Landsat 7, it's, it's red, green, blue, and near IR all together as one band, one bandwidth combined. So it's basically a black and white picture. It's a single band, but it's at 15 meters. And then um, we have thermal data. Thermal data is emitted light. It's, it's, it's heat, basically. Why they call it thermal? It's heat. And that on Landsat 7 is 60 meters. And on Landsat 8 is 100 meters. We kind of went a little bit backwards on that. Um, it's 100 meters. Um, and it's, so it would appear a little more fuzzy than, uh, than the regular reflected data. Now, what can you see? You can see um, neighborhoods. And let's see. Actually... For example, this is um, what I'm showing you now is a map that was done with reefs, um, and they were able to to um, to see all the different kinds of reefs. Um, it's not just that there's coral reef out there, but that there's fringing reef, and there's pinnacles and patches, and there's a shallow barrier reef and a deep reef, and they were able to tell all that using using the data. Um, Oh, come on, you can go backwards. Uh, here, we're seeing um, fields, farming fields. We can tell um, 130 meters is like 100 feet. So we can see details of 100 feet. We can sharpen that up some, sort of um, make it high def. And we did that when we went from Landsat 7 to Landsat 8 by increasing the number of pixels, uh, or the number of pixels we brought down. Um, instead of, uh, of um, bringing in 12, we're bringing in uh, 14. So, so it's sharpened it up, and the differences between Landsat 8 and Landsat 7 is like between high def and and regular um, channels on your TV. You can still see everything, it's just really sharpened up. But in general, um, we can see fields. Um, we can, the agricultural extension agents really love it. We can see, as you showed earlier, Brian, um, the growth of cities over time. Um, we can see how they've expanded. We can see the streets and all that. We just can't see the details of the cars in the driveway or the pool in the backyard or the new patio they put on. But we can see how many houses are on a block and the streets that are in that neighborhood and then the town that's nearby and the park and all that kind of stuff. A little bit of a clarifying question. I know that usually, and, and astronomers have a, do a lot of, a lot of them do some astrophotography and so they're very aware of the resolution of their own cameras that they're using. And of course, people with digital cameras are, are aware of that. Um, you referred to the, I, I guess the pixel density and you just said, I, I think 14 pixels. And usually people think about, you know, pixels on a, a number of pixels on a side. And so could you clarify that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, and I knew it as I was saying it that I had the wrong word and I couldn't remember what the right word was. Bits. We're bringing down 12, each measurement we make. Um, in Landsats 1, 2, and 3, we could only handle eight bits, I mean, eight bits worth of data for each, each measurement, um, basically for each pixel. We could only do eight bits. Um, Landsat 4 and 5, we, um, no, I took it back, it was even less than that. On 4 and 5, we had 9 bits measured on board, we brought down 8. On Landsat 7, we have 9 on board, we bring down 8. On Landsat 8, we have 14 on board, we bring down 12. 
And the Landsat 9 that we're building now, we've got 14 on board. We're going to bring down all 14. So Landsat 9 is going to be even higher resolution, um, more high def, in essence, sharper um, than 8, which is sharper than 7. So, so that's part of the technology that's evolved over the years, is that. And then the technology that, that um, was illustrated by that earlier question of data on products only being available on tape. And sometimes it took um, uh, nine inch reels, it would take like seven of them draped on your arm was one, was one scene, one for each of the bands. And then that's what you carried over to your computer and you just read them in one band at a time. And now it's just a download, a quick download of a couple terabytes, and there's your data. Okay. Well, that was good. And so that, that you know, kind of clarifies because a lot of people that are familiar with um, digital cameras are aware of, you know, image depth. And, and, uh, and so that really yeah. clarifies that. So thank you. Um, kind of staying with this idea about agriculture, Richard asks, any idea of how much Landsat has contributed to increased agricultural production, say per farmer or per acre or something like that? Has it contributed? It has contributed and there have been studies done um, by various think tanks that evaluate the, um, the monetary worth of the Landsat program. In other words, um, what's its contribution um, versus the cost it takes to launch it and all that as part of our um, trying to convince the government that, look, you know, we're bringing you back, you know, 100 times your investment. The return on investment is amazing. So keep funding the program. You know, it's, it's, it's a duh question. But um, uh, it's becoming even more productive, it's becoming even more valuable because of the introduction of the thermal data and our development of applications like this one on the right, which gets us into evapotranspiration and the ability to monitor the use of water, especially in our Western states, um, in, the U in the US, um, where water is, is such a high price and, and a valuable commodity. Um, and so they can monitor the fields that way and be a lot more um, less aggressive on the use of um, herbicides and, um, and insecticides and fertilizer um, based on the information that they get back. Um, agriculture was actually one of the initial reasons why Landsat was launched. Um, back in, the, um, in 1970, I believe it was, um, all, we always got our information about what was happening around the world with crops through the CIA. Um, the Central Intelligence Agency had agents on the ground. It, it referred to um, in-country sources and it estimated what the um, crop futures were around the world. And that went into how we would value our surplus and what we would do with our crops. Um, and it turned out that in the early 70s, Russia had a humongous wheat crop failure and no one knew it. The CIA didn't catch it. Um, either it was hidden or they just totally missed it. And as a result, the Russians came and bought up most of the US wheat surplus at a very favorable price which would not have been so favorable if we had realized that they had no wheat of their own. And once that was learned, the, the, um, some folks from uh, um, uh, Johnson Space Center actually were called in. They had been doing a lot of agricultural work using phot the photographic um, monitoring. And they were called in to the White House and asked, you got to do something. You got to figure it out make it work. Um, don't let this happen again. And so um, when the concept of Landsat came around, it just was a perfect match. And we had other issues that we were following as well. There's a corn blight um, that uh, was some sort of a corn fungus, I believe, um, that was being monitored. And they proved that Landsat 
um, monitoring from space could actually help them find all the crops and monitor the spread of that. So over time, it has proved invaluable. And it's getting better and better with the addition of more bands, um, more careful crafting of the bands so that we avoid areas of, of water absorption um, in the spectrum and get a, a clearer signal. And so um, it's, it's a very useful tool. It does not get us to precision agriculture. We don't have the, the fidelity to get down to um, a, the small crop areas, especially in Europe and China where the, the fields are regular shape, irregularly shaped and very small. And um, we don't come around enough. We have two satellites up there, so we get eight day repeat. Every eight days we have either seven or eight is, is imaging. Um, but we need more satellites up there. We would love to have a sustained imaging system, which is hopefully gonna make it through the budget process. And we would have three, four, maybe five satellites up there. And we would coordinate with international satellites. There's a European satellite system called Sentinel-2, which is the very first one in all the years since we've, we've been doing this that has come up and said, we're going to do what Landsat does, free data, and, and we're going to do global imaging. We're not going to point and shoot and just try to sell our data and, and answer requests. We're going to make sure that everybody gets the data and that we're taking the whole world. So we have a partner up there and we're really excited about that. And we're making sure the data are comparable between the two systems. Yeah. I think that one of the things uh, also on, on NASA Earth Observatory, there's a lot of imagery that shows up in there. I think that um, it's probably pretty evenly split between uh, uh, astronaut photography from the ISS and, and Landsat. But a lot of times you see these comparisons either in time of scenes or sometimes you see ones with charts where they're actually showing you know, things like the ozone amount or something mm -hmm. like that, which kind of brings up a, a question uh, based on what Darian asked. He said, can Landsat photography, he's very specific here, uh, can Landsat be, photography be useful for oil and gas exploration by monitoring methane emissions from seeps? And so I, I guess that speaks to the question is, is, um, is Landsat sensitive to those sorts of things or is it, uh, or, or are those outside the realm of what they're, it's capable of doing? Um, Landsat only looks at light. So we're only looking um, at reflected light or at emitted um, light in the thermal region of the spectrum. Um, we're not looking at chemistry. Um, however, the oil and um, mineral exploration folks were some of our first and largest and continue to be very avid users of Landsat data. And they're using geology to find their, their um, goals, their resources. So um, the fact that they were getting geological data over the world without having to fly um, uh, planes and without tipping their hand to um, competitors as to where they were looking um, gave them a real leg up. And so um, Exxon and, and, well, Esso back then and um, BP and all those guys have been tremendous users of Landsat data. And although geology doesn't change, land cover does change. And so areas that were covered um, at one point and now get denuded perhaps, or um, the snow melts, geology becomes obvious. And so they, um, they uh, have new places to look. So they are definitely using um, Landsat for oil and mineral exploration. Well, we're running a little bit late, but there is one other question here, and I think I know the answer to this one, but I want to hear it from you, and, and I suspect that it has to do with field of view. Um, and so Richard asks, can you see the rivers in the sky? And I'm guessing that he's meaning the uh, weather phenomena of the atmospheric rivers that have brought all these waves of moisture to the West Coast. The only way we see them is by seeing the clouds. Um, we're, we're not radar, we're an optical system. 
So if there's um, clouds over the fields, then we don't see through them down to the fields. We just see light reflected off the top of the clouds. So in that sense, we see it, but um, we're not the right mission for, for um, monitoring those rivers or for seeing them. On the other hand, um, our, one of our early science teams um, for Landsat 7 had a cloud specialist in there. And he used Landsat to actually get pictures of the clouds. He wanted to see the surface of the clouds and their structure. And, um, and we have a very, um, you can see it out on Earth Observer, on Earth Observer um, the Carmen Street Vortex um, phenomenon when uh, uh, wind pushes clouds over a piece of land that's like a mile high or more. And, um, and then that land coming up interrupts the flow of the clouds if it's a low cloud um, formation and then induces vortices. And you have this wonderful picture of vortices um, just going on and on and on. And it, it, they're just beautiful. Yeah, I think I've seen that. They are beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, Terry, if I could get you to uh, stop sharing your screen. I think uh, that's uh, brought us to the end here. So I want to thank Terry for, uh, you know, very graciously staying, you know, a few minutes late here and for uh, being up what's uh, past my bedtime if I was on the East Coast. So, so thank you very much for sharing. This was absolutely fascinating. The imagery was just great. And uh, we did have a, a couple of inquiries. Do you mind if we share your slides with, um, with the people? I, th I know that a lot of people would like to be able to see um, and perhaps even use it in some of their outreach. Or is that fine with you? Yep, that's okay. fine with me. And there are actually notes. Um, in it's a PowerPoint. There are actually notes, and um, uh, in the notes are sometimes uh, the photo credits or um, other resources, such as um, websites that you can go out to to get more information. Okay. So sure. Well, this is fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Terry. This is great. Well, that's all for tonight, everyone. You'll be able to find this webinar along with many others on the Night Sky Network website in the Outreach Resources section. Each webinar's page also features additional resources and activities. We will post tonight's uh, presentation on the Night Sky Network YouTube channel in the next few days, as well as on the Outreach Resource page.